Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. Probably by now you're familiar with what this show is about, but in case this is the first time you've watched or listened to it, it's an interview show which we produce weekly here in Fairfield, Iowa at FPAC, which is the Fairfield Public Access TV station. Uh, interview show in which we talk with people who have had a spiritual awakening. And we'll get into defining that during the course of this interview, but generally we're referring to an awakening which appears to be permanent, or as some people like to call it, an abiding awakening, as opposed to <coughs> a particular experience which came and went. <coughs> my name is Rick Archer, <coughs> and my guest tonight is Tom Trainer. And I've referred to Tom a few times. You want to start over? Rick? That's all right. all right. All right, let's start over, since I coughed. <coughs> wow. <coughs> Just start myself. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. This is an interview show in which we talk about spiritual awakenings which, with people who have had them. And uh, by spiritual awakening, we mean a permanent shift in consciousness. I say permanent because many people have spiritual experiences and they come and they go again. But um, there are plenty of people in Fairfield, Iowa, where the show is produced, uh, and plenty of people elsewhere, whom I eventually will interview, um, who apparently have undergone an awakening that hasn't left them. Um, so that's what we're talking about. Tonight's guest is Tom Trainer, and Tom has lived here in Fairfield for many years. And I've referred to Tom a few times on uh, this show because he and his wife Cindy host a satsang or spiritual discussion group, which I've been attending for many years, and which anyone else is welcome to attend. And in fact, if you would like to, uh, maybe later in the show, Tom will give out his phone number or email address, and you can contact him. If you live outside of Fairfield, Iowa, we have a professional quality conference phone in the room, and you can dial in and participate that way. So, Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming in. It's good to be here, Rick. Mm -hmm. I've kind of been saving Tom because, you know, I, I know where he is, I know how to get him, and I know he can come more or less on a moment's notice. Uh, and I figured one of these days one of my guests is going to sprain an ankle or something. And in fact, this week my guest canceled out, uh, couldn't do it at the last minute. And so Tom was gracious enough to come in. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Good. So as we customarily have been doing, why don't you start by just giving us a little biographical information about yourself, where you come from, what you do for a living or did for a living, anything you think is significant. Okay. Well, Cindy and myself moved here from Rochester, New York 10 years ago to be part of the community mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons, one of which was after many years of working at Kodak, Cindy's job was going away and there was no, nothing to hold us there. The community was wonderful. We'd been visiting here regularly. And we showed up mm -hmm. and in fact, it was 10 years ago. Hmm. Had a good time, enjoyed being here. My background was as a, I spent almost 27 years as a headhunter. And one of the jokes that I make with some of my friends is, I used to be a headhunter and now I'm a soul hunter. <laughs> and I, I, so it was sort of implicit in what you said that the reason you came to Fairfield, Iowa, of all places, from Rochester, New York, is that you were practicing meditation, you were on a spiritual path, and this is a, sort of a mecca of sorts for that. There are a lot of people here who meditate. Yeah, that was it. I have been, as of t this week, this weekend, roughly, mm -hmm. it's, uh, for me, it's 37 years of mm -hmm. TM. And what was fun is we were visiting here. We would use two of the four weeks of vacation we had, mm -hmm. spring and fall, to come and visit the community. And we have a lot of friends who have moved here, and some have moved away. And, but we loved coming, we loved visiting, and we just liked the idea that if we're going to move someplace, which it would appear way the economy was going, why not Fairfield? Mm. Of course, the, my daughter didn't think that was such a cool idea, and Cindy's mom didn't think it was such a great idea. It's, but this is what we had to do. Mm -hmm. 
Now, didn't, didn't I give your introductory lecture in TM? Or? Yes, oh, you okay. gave an introductory lecture sometime in the fall of 1972. <laughs> but at that time, I wasn't quite ready to uh -huh. m fulfill all the requirements of practicing TM. Uh -huh. I, I thought it was a great idea. I was in a very stressful job, and yeah. but I wasn't right, quite ready mm. to give up my other addictions for a new one, <laughs> uh -huh. which was going to be benefit me. So right. it, was, it was a little bit before I was ready, but I, I recognized that when you came mm -hmm. and you talked, there was something there for me. And later on, it became quite clear mm -hmm. that this is the path for me. Had you been kind of reading spiritual books or thinking about spiritual things and so on before that, or did you just kind of come on a whim? No, I had done some reading. Mm -hmm. I had done some things. I had practiced some meditation that it kind of learned out of a book. And I had a pretty awesome experience with that, mm. which was one of those, wow, this is interesting. Huh. And, and I'd had some feeling throughout my life that there was some clarity and that that clarity allowed me to see part of the me that wasn't there most of the time. But it was kind of like a wave of clarity would pop up every three, four years, and there'd be a day of just real clear, and then it would get murky again. What would you see during those clear days? How things were connected, and how mm. I was connected, and that my life was blessed, even though it wouldn't appear, because I was high-stress job, all that stuff. Mm. And I was your typical young person, uh, drinking and smoking and doing all the bad things. Uh -huh. Four packs of palm oils a day <laughs> wow. and alcohol. I uh -huh. didn't do the kind of drugs that you guys did because you were younger, but I did some of them. Mm -hmm. And that's what had a transition from the traditional vices to trying some of the other vices that the younger people were trying. <laughs> so I consider myself a little older. Yeah. I remember my father coming to me one time and saying, can you give me some of that stuff you guys are taking? Yeah. You know, I'm not happy and, and uh, I really want to be happy. And I, I was sort of like, I don't know, Dad, I don't think this is going to make you happy. And as a matter of fact, he said the same thing to me after I've been meditating for about, I don't know, four or five months. He said, you've really changed. He said, yeah. whatever you're doing, I want to do it. And uh, he started actually, got a lot of benefit out of it. I even one time I had an employee and he had only been working for me about three months. This, and it was my own business, but it was still a high-stress business. Mm -hmm. And some stuff happened, and I had a, three phone calls going at one time, A, B, and C. And I handled them just in an order that was appropriate. One I was gruff with, one I was smooth with, and one I was like... Mm -hmm. And afterwards, and I finished all three calls, he t took a look at me and he said, you know, after I watched you, either you're totally schizophrenic <laughs> or this meditation stuff is interesting. <laughs> so he learned. Uh -huh. And what was really interesting is he would sometimes slough off. And he told me that his kids would actually, one of them would say, Dad, you didn't meditate today. He'd go, oh, yes, I did. And the kid would say, Dad, you're lying. Because <laughs> I know you didn't because you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so it was good. So... Um, so se fall of 72 or so, you saw that intro, and then you finally... January 73, about okay. the second or third week. And I've fo totally forgotten the exact day, right, right, right. Blah, 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 blah. who remembers, right? And uh, was it the kind of thing where you turned your life around real fast, or was it sort of like... Oh, no, it was incredible. Yeah? Came home the very first night after, and what had happened is we had wanted to be initiated as a family, and so the teacher was Susan Green, I think? Green, right. Yeah. So, she wanted to work us in, so she put us at the end. So we sat around for about three hours, kind of pretty hungry and tired, so we didn't learn until near the end. And when she got me in the room, she kept saying, open your eyes. <laughs> I couldn't open my eyes. Finally, she just said, open your eyes and look at me. And when I got them <laughs> open, she said, now, don't shut them again. <laughs> I was like 45 minutes huh. with my eyes shut. They just couldn't get me open. I wow. went home. And my usual, I went right to the liquor cabinet mm -hmm. and I opened the door and I took down, because my usual habit was to have a double bourbon Manhattan mm -hmm. every night. Mm -hmm. And I took it and I set it down and I looked at it really hard and I put it away. Huh. And I never touched it. Never touched Interesting. A hard alcohol. Uh -huh. I, I had a little wine, little beers, yeah. but that was the end. Those double bourbon Manhattans, which huh. were the only way I got through the day, mm. stopped. How about the cigarettes? They stopped about 18 months later. Tapered off? Tapered right off. Went on a, a five-day 
grounding me meditation course down at Livingston Manor. Mm -hmm. And th the rules were you could only smoke in the parking lot. Uh -huh. Can't smoke around everything else. So, and then you have to leave all your smoking materials in your car. Mm -hmm. So every day at lunchtime, I would, that was the first thing I'd do. I didn't even go to have lunch. I'd go get a smoke. By the third day, I was like, I'd take the stuff up. <laughs> Whoa. Uh -huh. That was it. Done. Never wanted to do it again. Uh -huh kind of where the bars are these days. You have to go out in the parking lot. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Society is evolving. <clears throat> um, in case anybody wonders whether this show is like a, you know, an advertisement for Transcendental Meditation, it's, it's sort of co it's, it's coincidental in a way that all my guests talk about it because in this town, most of the people whom I might be interviewing have a history of practicing it. But um, sooner or later, we're going to get the ability to use Skype or some such thing to interview people long distance. And undoubtedly, I'll be interviewing a lot of people who've never done TM. And they've done other things and arrived at spiritual awakenings in, the, in their own way. So uh, where shall we go from here? So we've, we've got you meditating and off uh, liquor and, and <laughs> tobacco. And uh, you continued along doing your headhunter job and meditating regularly and going to courses and whatnot. And, and as, as you sort of follow that timeline, are there any sort of significant events that happened? Uh, what was really significant was I, I had not been doing headhunting when I learned TM. Mm -hmm. And the company I worked for was a total disaster. And they filed bankruptcy within a year. Mm -hmm. And two years later, I was looking for a job. I had worked for the trustee, which was a judge for a couple of years and I really was out looking and I walked into this headhunting agency and there was this very, I sat waiting to interview with the guy and the guy who owned it and my eye kept looking at this empty office hmm. Then there was this little voice in the back of my head that said, maybe there's a job here for you. And hmm. I'm thinking, oh well. I went in and sat down, he interviewed me and at the end of the interview he said, would you ever consider working for me in this business? And mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about it but huh. I wasn't doing too good in the job market huh. and started and did fairly well, but I, I had a dry period. It was commission only, and there came an opportunity to get an advanced TM meditation technique. I didn't have any money, and it was blah, 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 you know, all the whole story about things, but I really kind of thought this was important. I felt important. So I managed to take an advance on my credit card. Mm -hmm. I think it was 150 bucks. And I went and learned on a weekend, mm -hmm. I went in the office Monday and one of my clients called up and said, you know that guy that you sent the resume over on Thursday? Yes, yes. Well, we liked him so much. We brought him in Friday. We made him an offer on Friday. He accepted this morning. So will you send me an invoice? Oh, cool. Now, not having had any money in six right. months, it wasn't a lot. But from that point forward, I never missed making money. Hmm. That was a nice steady income, but when I, and then I made the same decision that the cities were available and I decided it was time. Cities, define cities. The cities is a, an advanced meditation course where a lot more practice, a lot longer time period, and more specific techniques, primarily practicing specific verses out of the Patanjali Sutras. Okay. I went down to Livingston Manor, New York, and got that course. June of, two, of 1980, mm -hmm. every month thereafter, my income tripled and never went below that. It was mm -hmm. a significant change. When cool. I, in other words, when I, even though the money was tight and everything, when I made the commitment to do something for me, yeah. all of a sudden, the whole picture changed. Mm. And I began to see there was a connection. I take care of me, the universe takes care of me. Seek ye first the kingdom of Heaven and all else should be added unto that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> cool. So now we're up to about 1980-ish. Yes. Okay. And uh, when did you move to Fairfield? About I moved in 1999. Okay. So we have about a 20-year period to cover there still. Yep. Um, any significant milestones during that period? We're getting up to the point where, you know, you underwent a, a really significant yes, and permanent correct. shift. But yeah. I just want to touch upon any significant milestones that may yeah. have... In 1983, mm -hmm. uh, December 28th, 1983, when a half of my friends from the TM community of Rochester, New York, were here for mm -hmm. a very large meditation mm -hmm. course. I think they called it the 7,000. Oh, in the wintertime? Wintertime. Oh, yeah, December 28th, yeah. 1983. Mm -hmm. All, everybody, even one of my employees was here. Mm -hmm. 
and so we're trying to do double duty. And I had gotten a car, and I drove down about a mile from home, and a young lady who was hurrying to go skiing lost control and hit my car head on. Ooh. Had a head-on collision. She mm. was doing about 50, I was doing about 45. Wow. And I hadn't put the seatbelt on because I was just going down the road. Oh. Had what is considered to be a traditional near-death experience. Mm. The white light, the people, and the go all that stuff happens. Mm -hmm. And But it wasn't very long. But when you're in that kind of a situation, it seems like an infinity. Right. And then... <laughs> Some, one of them's whispered in Mary, you can stay as long as you want. Then another one whispers, but what about your son? Now my son, the teenage son, was in the car, trapped. All of a sudden, I'm back in the car, mm. all that nice stuff, all those nice people and that white light and all that stuff, gone. And they call it a near-death experience, but from my side and my experience and the feeling level, it's death. Mm. You learn what death is. Mm -hmm. It's not so spooky. It's not anything to worry about. It's, yeah. it's, you know, it, we all have some fears. After that, death was not a, a fear of mine. Right. And things went on, as, as my ex-wife would say, she knows what TM is all about. She said, I know what TM's about. It's called terminated marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes had, some truth to well, that. Well, we had <laughs> taken different paths. We right, had gone, right. so all of a sudden, that's over in 88. And I had a lot of emotional investment even though it wasn't a perfect marriage, and it took me a long time to process that. And in the process, I just lost interest in my business, uh -huh. lost interest in a lot of things, and became much more con focused on my spiritual aspect because mm. making money had been easy. The rest of it wasn't so easy. Uh, right. You mean relationships? Relationships. Things like that. Spirituality, right. all that stuff. Mm. So in the process, I lost what we would call the attachment to making money, huh. and it's pretty easy to do. Yeah, I would suggest perhaps that losing the attachment to making money doesn't mean you're not gonna make it. Uh, I think a person could theoretically make lots of money and not be attached to it right. or to making it, but in your particular case, I guess you just needed to shift your focus altogether and focus on something else. And, from, and what the, the business I used to do is pretty process orientated mm -hmm. and it's n it basically it's, a, it's based on doing the numbers. Right. And it became, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. I don't want to do this particular thing. I'm really good at it. I make a lot of money at it. I don't want to do it. <laughs> and 27 years of it, that's enough. Yeah. And I weaned myself out of it. Uh -huh. Kind of hung out for a couple of years and my current wife supported me and still mm. does because I'm retired and she works. But mm -hmm. we have a good relationship. Yeah. We found each other. Mm -hmm. We had, there's a, that was another serendipity thing. We met as on our TM Cities course mm -hmm. and she became my buddy. Everybody gets assigned ah, a buddy. Just randomly? Well, what happened was we had two young men, two older men, two married couples, and there was only two oddballs mm. left over, Cindy and I. Okay, oh, that's we cool. became buddies. That kind of a little bit foreshadowing of yeah. future events. So. Huh. Interesting. So uh, you're probably getting close to the point in your story where you moved to Fairfield, but I remember you telling some other things that happened back in Rochester that I thought were interesting. Like, f and, and you know, feel free to, f to fill in other significant yep. things if, if we're skipping something important. But I remember one time you, you've told this story about how you were at dinner or something in the Rochester TM Center and you could hear, pick up on everybody's thoughts like a minute before they spoke them or some such thing? That was a, one of those, you sit down to meditate and you're just sitting there in silence. There was nothing going on but silence. And all of a sudden the silence just kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And all of a sudden I realized that my eyes are shut. Mm -hmm. I'm inside looking out, but then the next moment was, well, are my eyes shut or not? So I'm outside looking at myself. Uh. I'm outside my body, and those eyes were shut. I can guarantee you that. See so yourself I'm sitting there. I'm still sitting, but my focus of attention is now outside the body, mm -hmm. looking at the body. Yep, those eyes are shut. You're uh. doing good, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, that went from 360. Hmm. I could see everything in the room. Hmm. And at the same time, there was this shower of what I called golden light and diamond light. Was, mm. And they were droplets 
coming out of somewhere way up high above mm. the top of my head and they were coming down and I just watched them and they were washing through my whole body and it really was great. Mm. And then there's a p little, you know, curiosity killed the cat. You've uh -huh. heard that, right? All of a sudden there's this idea, where do these droplets go? Uh -huh. And all of a sudden my attention went on a droplet and I followed it all the way back to wherever it came from. Hmm. And the next thing I know, I'm waking up, laying on the floor with no memory of laying down or anything. Hmm. I totter my way upstairs at the TM Center and there's 30 people in the kitchen, mm -hmm. dinner and people are yakking away. And all of a sudden there's this sense that my focus of attention is not inside my body. It's up in that corner, the farthest corner away from everybody. Mm -hmm. And the whole experience was like, as Ryogi would say, deja vu all over again. <laughs> but it was like watching a movie that you've seen a thousand times. Mm. You know every word of the script. Mm. And then all of a sudden I'm hearing in my mind people's thoughts. So Ricky's thoughts would appear in my mind and in Ricky's tone of voice. Mm. And then a minute later, Rick Archer would say the same thought. So it was like watching a tape delay of what's going on. Now with 30 people, you would, you'd think it would be just impossible. Right. I was hearing every voice discreetly twice. Hmm. Once when they thought the thoughts began to come into their consciousness, mm -hmm. I was picking it up long before they did. Mm -hmm. And then again, as they spoke the thought. Hmm. And everything was sorted out, like Mary's there and George was there and Susie's here and Billy's there. All of that conversation was totally discreet. Hmm. And I'm still up in that corner watching this whole thing, but I wasn't in the corner. It was like I was more than the room. I was beyond the room, but that was the closest point hmm. to have some kind of relevance. But I couldn't say a word. Now, for me not to talk, <laughs> So you, you know, weren't eating or talking, you were just kind of sitting there. No, I, I started to eat. That oh. was all I could do uh -huh. because it was like overloaded data. It was like I'm, I'm tapping into an infinite download, but I've got a finite body here. This yeah. is, this is over, almost overload. It was right. close. And it, I, talking was totally out of the question because you're picking up every thought and it's in the voice of the person and then mm. you hear that person say it. And it took about 30 seconds before me I got this what was going on. Because I remembered Ricky having this thought and a minute, little minute later, Ricky says the same thing. It's like, well, whoa, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> and it, it, this took two or three right. seconds to figure this out that I'm tapped in. There's mm. something going on that's bigger than this little me. Mm. And from that day forward, things were definitely shifted. But I mm. didn't know at that moment that I was awake. Huh. As significant as that experience was, it still wasn't understandable that that's part of an awakening process because it shifted me a lot, but there was still all of the stuff that goes on in daily mm -hmm. life. I have two points that come to mind. One is that I, you would probably agree that most people who have awakenings aren't going to have that particular experience. That's just no, something that you happen to have. That was yeah. over the top. Right. And then the second point is that that is probably not the kind of experience you'd want to have perpetually. It was sort of interesting to have, but you wouldn't want to live your life that way. Correct. Right. There was also that understanding, but that didn't come for maybe seven or eight years, that, mm -hmm. that you wouldn't be able to live a life if you had that at that ramped up value. Yeah. And it also became clear at the same time, eight years later, that I had the, the same ability but on the real silent level. Mm. In other words, so I'm, when I'm with people, I kind of like I'm picking up on their feelings, but I'm not, it's not happening up here. It's happening in the totality. And it's, so I'm really kind of sensitive to what's going on around me with, mm -hmm. with people, and particularly when I'm in a group with people and I'm trying to you know, make things, just kind of help people express mm -hmm. what they want to say. So it's kind of like real sensitivity mm -hmm. without hearing, because it, it would, believe me, a day of that would just, <laughs> you'd want to change, can I sign in for the rubber room, please? Send the guys in white coats, I'm ready. <laughs> so uh, for those seven or eight years that it took you to kind of realize that this is not necessarily going to be characteristic of enlightenment, were you sort of pining for that experience? Or oh, thinking, God, yes. I gotta oh, want that again. God, yes. How, how did I get that? Where are those golden right, droplets? Right, 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 right. <laughs> I mean, here, if this is what 
and most people would call peak experience. Right. Over the top. I wasn't looking for it. I didn't ask for it. It shows yeah. up. Yeah. And I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. It took a long time to understand what had happened that mm. day. So what was it that seven or eight years later kind of caused you to relax and, and not stop looking for that experience again? It was probably only about three years that I stopped looking for it because I realized that there was no way. I didn't create this. Right. And kind of one of the things I finally figured out that I was able to express to someone else, they were asking me, like you're asking mm -hmm. me, and I'm telling them, I do this, I tell stories all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm a storyteller. I can't help not telling stories. So as I'm telling the story, I realized this wasn't me that did this. Mm -hmm. It was like being able to tap in to the infinite stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. And it was so, it was kind of like, like a 20 million candle watt uh, strobe light went off. And I just happened to be in the neighborhood and it, it got imprinted on this physiology, but yeah. I didn't do this. Mm -hmm. I was just an innocent bystander. True, so, but I don't think it would have been, I think it was, not coincidental that it happened to you. No, you know? it wasn't coincidental. <laughs> but it, it was the understanding. It was, I wasn't the doer of this thing. Right. I didn't create it. It was just somebody said, "Hey, this is your turn at the bat." Right? right. Bam. Whoa. Mm. And then there was a lot of understanding that came later. A lot mm -hmm. of things happened that helped build. But I still mm -hmm. didn't consider myself awake. Mm -hmm. Didn't even think that was what was going on mm. because just didn't get. It. I didn't have the understanding that what happened that day. Mm -hmm. Something happened that was really significant. Didn't get that. Mm. So a couple of things here. Now, one, you said that after that experience, life was never the same again. And second, you said a lot of things happened later that kind of helped build up to the understanding that you have now. So would it be worthwhile to kind of tell me in what way life was different after that experience and what some of those things were that kind of put the pieces of the puzzle into place for you? The first thing that happened, which after today, I can basically say, I went through what would be called the dark night of the soul, primarily related to the body. And we've had some experience and some friends that I've talked about that there's essentially three of those, one of the body, one of the soul, and one of being or conscious. You know, it's three the, dark Three nights? separate dark nights. Ah. But the, each of them gets easier. So the first one of the body was mm -hmm. feeling that I had lost the attachment to the body. Mm. Even though the near-death experience had been seven years earlier, all of a sudden it was like, body come, body go, not a problem. Right. And that so was- What's dark about that? That's nice. Well, huh? because everything that you considered near and dear was going. Uh -huh. the, the relationships, it just, it was like this out of sync, being out of sync with everything around you. You don't fit into the world again. Mm. Not only now, you, you, I knew about the death of the body. Now I began to realize the death of the, the soul or the spirit part was mm -hmm. that this is insubstantial too. So it was, it was a lot that happened over a period of time and it was really hard to deal with until I found two of my friends that were there that we began to meet regularly once a week, which mm -hmm. is the beginning of the meeting we have here, mm -hmm. was we were all going through the same thing. Huh. We were like, what's happening? I don't understand. Today, there's a lot of good stuff on the net. You can look it up. There wasn't much. And I didn't even read about St. John of the Cross until many years later. Mm. He's the guy who wrote the book about the Dark Knight of the Soul. Yeah, he's the classic. There's a better one that's, that was written by a person, and it's on uh, mystic.org. If you Google, go mystic.org and mm -hmm. Google Dark Knight of the Soul, mm -hmm. it's a really, really well done description mm. of process and what's happening because he actually was able to document a lot that I had missed. And when I read it, I go, yeah, that happened. Yeah, that happened. Yeah, that happened. Mm -hmm. I had forgotten all this stuff. He's a contemporary guy who wrote Yeah, he's wrote this a couple years ago. Yeah. So the first phase of the Dark Knight of the Soul that happened after awakening was this sort of progressive detachment from your body and relationships and things of the physical world. Right. And the second phase was what, did you say? Kind of this, the, well, you could define it as the, the, the soul part, but that wasn't so significant. The body part was losing everything you considered near and dear. You weren't literally losing it. I mean, you didn't lose your body, you didn't necessarily lose your no. wife, but you were losing the sort of grip. That, that gripped 
essence of how you define your life by how tightly you've been riveted, and all of a sudden, this stuff just started to fall apart. Mm. Yeah. And you have the feeling like, I could live to be 100, I could die tomorrow, you know, whatever. Yeah, but then yeah. You, the part of you goes, but what about, you know, you, you know, I still had kids, although they were adults. It was right. like, well, you know, I worry about my kids, and then I don't worry about them. Then I do worry about them, then I don't. I mean, it was like this on and off, and you're a bad person because you're not worrying about your kids, you know. Like, <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, but, I, but, I, but, but, you know, the, so that you go back and forth yeah. with this. All of that demon part of yourself, right. all of a sudden, you got to deal with it. So you used to sort of equate worry and taking things very seriously and, uh, oh, this is a big problem, that is a big problem, with being a responsible guy. Of course. And, and now you don't have that weight on your shoulders and you're thinking, am I becoming irresponsible? Am I crazy? Right. Yeah, I am crazy. <laughs> but this, uh, the world doesn't like crazy people. Welcome to the monkey house. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> so, yeah. so all that was going on and that took a two, three years. And, okay. and then the next big thing was to go to the Natural Law Party Convention in Washington, D.C. in 1996. Define your terms. So, Natural Law Party? It's a political party that was primarily people from the Transcendental Meditation Organization that were trying to muscle their way into the political world uh -huh. and put together a real party with third-party candidate and a bunch of us were really gung-ho. We were going to volunteer. We were going to mm -hmm. change the world. I mean, it's like the 60s in a different form. Yeah, you missed that, so you're doing yeah, it. I missed the 60s. <laughs> I didn't get to do the 60s. I volunteered to help uh -huh. out. And I was invited to go to the convention in Washington, D.C. with some other friends. And uh, they didn't have anybody from Alabama. So they said, well, we need some Alabama. You're from Alabama. I don't know if well, yes, you are from Alabama. <laughs> but that put you in the front row. I see with A. I mean the very yeah, A was the first letter, mm -hmm. so we're in the front row and they're filming this on C SPAN. And I just the funny part of it was we practiced everything we were gonna do on Thursday, mm -hmm. we did on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So we practiced every speech, everything happened. You went through the whole thing, everything that was going to happen the next day. So we script. It was all scripted. So we're blah, 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 blah. We're going through this whole thing. So Thursday shows up, and we show up, and the TV cameras are on, and all of us speeches are being given, and I don't even know who was talking, but all of a sudden, it felt like these angels somewhere just ripped my chest open, metaphorically speaking, mm -hmm. and they took this little tiny heart that had been pinched and burned and divorced and hurt and spanked when I was a kid and, and my kids had been you know mean to me and my ex-wife was mean to me and mm -hmm. blah, 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 all that employees stole from me and all those little hurts mm -hmm. <laughs> took it right out and threw it on the floor the angels did metaphorically <laughs> speaking and then they decided to do a dance huh. and and there was two things going on one I am crying like a baby Hmm. Snot's running down my nose. Luckily, the TV camera at that time was somewhere else. I didn't have a handkerchief. The mm -hmm. tears are flowing, and Cindy's trying to help me, and I'm just total, I'm a basket case. Mm -hmm. The other half of that was this feeling of freedom. Mm -hmm. All of those hurts, that piece of angst, that anxiety, that total, ah, oh, you know, you've just been squeezed. Your heart's been squeezed one too many times. Mm -hmm. Pfft, disappeared. I finally got stopped crying and kind of got myself together and then I began to laugh and I laughed and I laughed and I laughed and I laughed, <laughs> and I laughed through the next two days. And whoever was giving the lecture was like, what is this guy laughing? Right, I'm laughing. <laughs> at, at one point, one of the organizers, Bobby. Roth? Bobby Roth. Mm -hmm. he's, we're, he's doing the thing and he stops me and he goes, are we paying you to laugh? And I go, <laughs> no. He goes, we should be. <laughs> okay. But the following day when I showed up, or that evening, I finally looked internally. I closed my eyes. I looked mm -hmm. internally to where this little tiny heart had been. Mm -hmm. And whoa, before, during the meeting, it had been empty. Mm -hmm. There's nothing there. Just nothing. Silence, nothing. You mean after the extraction? After the heart was gone, right. there's nothing. I mean, no, right. nothing. It's just totally blank. Like, mm -hmm. wow, how'd they do that? You know, it's like racing your hard drive, except they erased your emotional drive. Mm -hmm. And I looked during the evening, I guess, and I looked in and I see the world. Hmm. Now, the symbol of the Natural Law Party was a shot from space of, of planet Earth with mm -hmm. the blues and the clouds and mm -hmm. the oceans. And I've seen something like that, but not, mm -hmm. it was more realistic. It was more like, 
real time, but oh, who do I know, you know? So I, okay, that's it. I mean, I don't know what's going on, but it's cool. And I'm busy, I got these people to talk to, and by the evening, later in the evening, not only was the sun there, but the moon was there. Hmm. And I wake up the next day, and when I pay attention I, during meditation, I look in. Now I see our solar system is there. Hmm. Okay, that's cool. By the end of the day, it was the galaxies, and by the end of the next day, it was all of creation was here, and I could see it, feel it, taste it, hmm. touch it. It was all there, and I'm going, whoa. I still didn't know I was awake. Hmm. That All that's going on and you don't know because nobody's there to say, you know, that's pretty good stuff, right? Yeah. Hmm. I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, do you feel that literally angels were involved in so-called extracting your heart and stomping on it? Or do you, is that, again, metaphorical and there was just some kind of process going on that, that didn't necessarily involve celestial beings? Yes and no. Uh -huh. It felt like it was a process and it could have been the angels. I, I, it just, that's the word that came it to felt me. That way. It felt like it. It's yeah. like that these folks are going to do you a favor, but it ain't going to be easy mm -hmm. and you, it may not be comfortable. Mm. And at the time I had been doing a lot of reading about angels and there mm. was a lot of, I guess my attention was on them because yeah. they felt there was some something special that came out. I read a couple different books about angels and their mm -hmm. part in our life and how mm -hmm. we interact. And, Hey, it was as good as any other ring. I mean, any whatever it did, did it. It was done yeah. over and out, right? And my second question is, if you look there now, what do you see? All creation. Still see it. So Still it's like a the, permanent thing. It's you, permanent. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, and I know myself to be all of creation. Mm -hmm. But I, at that time, that didn't, you know, I didn't know that meant being awake. Yeah. We'll, we'll get onto that bit a little later. I myself. keep saying it because, yeah. I, I, mean, no, I mean, I'm a slow about, learner, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I've been at this for 40-something years. Uh, now, okay, so that was, what year was that? that 96. 96, alrighty. And then I remember you telling a story about you're standing in the road talking to some guy and all of a sudden you realize I'm awake. Is that the appropriate next step to talk about or is there something significant? I in think between? so. It, okay. I had a couple of other things. That you were, can talk about them if you want. Well, Two weeks after the natural law party thing with this heart business, mm -hmm. I'm sitting in a restaurant with my friend Stan, who mm -hmm. was one of your guests here. Uh -huh. And I'm telling mm -hmm. Stan the story of how it went down. Mm -hmm. And as I start the story, Stan notices that what he thinks is a little black hole. Mm -hmm. He didn't know, it, all he knows is this piece of black in front of my mouth. Mm -hmm. And as mm -hmm. I continue telling it, kind of like the way I did, maybe I put in a few more details he, th this black hole kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until he couldn't see my head or my shoulders. Hmm. And then he started noticing that things were falling in, stars and moons and galaxies, hmm. and he got really upset. Because <laughs> in his mind, I believe, I've talked to him about it, he thought he was going to be next, right? And he wasn't going to go in that black hole. No way. So he screams, stop, stop, stop. From my side, I had... You didn't know you were doing it. No, I, mean, I have no idea. I'm just sitting here being me, telling this silly story, right? right? And he got so upset. Huh. And I said to him, what's the matter? He said, I can't talk about it. Hmm. Well, don't talk about that anymore either. Hmm. Okay. We just talked chit-chat. And he didn't tell me until much later hmm. that that little black hole never went away for the rest of the evening. We were there a couple hours talking huh. and just being friends. And mm -hmm. he was like... And he said, I didn't dare leave because he said, I thought maybe the... It would come after me. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think is the significance of that? I have no idea. Did you and Stan ever kind of arrive nope. at any meaning or nope. interpretation? Well, I mean, there, if you look at some of the Vedic literature, there's some stories about that happening to certain of the, the saints and hmm. people seeing, I guess it's Krishna opens his mouth. And, and the universe is in there. The universe yeah. is in the mouth. mother looks in there to get some butter out. And right. Yeah. And there's the, there's the universe, right? Hmm. And there's another one about somebody looking in and seeing creation falling in. Hmm. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it, 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 I, it didn't make any one bit of difference to me whether I did it or didn't. It, that, right. it was no, but to him, huge difference. Huh. Interesting. And of course, it's an eye, eye of the beholder kind of thing, because the waitress probably didn't see that. You know, no, Stan sure didn't. saw it. <laughs> I don't think Cindy did either, but right. she was, but Cindy's just connected. She likes, she loves me, and so whatever I say is fine. <laughs> you know how women that's, are. That's a good thing to say about your wife. Whatever you say, it's ah! fine, you know? Well, pretty much. <laughs> you know. 
Uh, okay. So that, that's a milestone. Yep, and that was a milestone. And you mentioned there might be another thing that you want to bring up before we get to the awakening stage. I don't think so. I think about that point, things were pretty well cooking, and we were also meeting weekly. And mm -hmm. at that point, there was a group of us, about seven or eight, that met. We would meditate together every Wednesday night mm -hmm. and go to dinner and go to this one restaurant, mm -hmm. and we would be there till 11.30 or midnight, and they would be closing the restaurant, and they'd say, well, you know, we love you guys, you're best customers, but we gotta close up. Are we and still we talking were, Rochester or back in Fairfield Rochester. Now? Okay, Rochester. This was Rochester from mm -hmm. like 96 to 99. Okay. And there was a lot then, that, but it was more, we'd, we'd have experiences, and mm -hmm. we'd talk about them among each other, <clears throat> and things stopped being big and flashy and became, just kind of smooth. There was this smoothness mm -hmm. about stuff. So nothing else stuck out in my mind. I think. Right. And we moved here in like, March 1st of 99. Mm -hmm. And nothing much happened except all of a sudden I realized Fairfield is the grand central for the spiritual universe. Everybody who's anybody makes a trek through Fairfield, at least back in that time. Yeah. Right? And, oh, wow, I'm here and I'm I'm meditating with all my friends, but wow, look who's coming to town. Mm. And of course, there's people like you and some other people. Yeah, you gotta go see this guy or this gal right. or blah, 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 blah. And then he'll go down there, wow. And I'd laugh and we'd have a good time. So in other words, you're referring to all these spiritual teachers who've been coming through yes. over the years. You know, Gangaji and Francis Lucille and Amaji and Karunamai and oh, yeah. Mother Fran Mira. Yeah, all of them. All these teachers. Yeah, and then all the Gangaji offshoots, which were, I don't know. Yeah, right. Half uh, a dozen of those. A whole those. bunch of those guys. Yeah, there was a mm -hmm. bunch of them. And they were all enjoyable. And there was even a few that were oddballs, like uh, this Billy something or other. She was a character. She was some kind of psychic. I vaguely remember that. Yeah, I, I didn't go, but I remember hearing yeah, about I, it. I went to see her. She was a trip. And mm -hmm. all these people were like, wow. And then... And one of them was, made some comment. Somebody said, was asking about angels, and Billy goes, well, you, there's an angel right here among you. And of course, I laughed. And this woman who asked the question turns around, and she says, she's talking about you, isn't it? I, don't matter, I don't know. Whatever you want it to be, I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and that was very helpful. The other uh, thing that was very helpful was FPAC Channel 9. Mm -hmm. At that time, and I don't know if they still do, I believe they do, were running tapes of Gangaji every Thursday night, mm -hmm. hour long. And there was something about watching how she presented the knowledge of awakening that began to kind of resonate internally. It didn't, wasn't like I was ready to claim it, but it was like, boy, this is really making sense and she's got good things to say. And then Andy Reimer showed up. Mm -hmm. And Andy, I went to did his one day seminar, which I don't know what he called, but it whatever it was, and while I was with Andy, there was this big gap hmm. while he was talking. All of a sudden, there was a gap, and then he announced that he's gonna do a long-term course, if you wanna call it that, where we would meet every three to four months for a weekend, and I just turned to my wife and said, I'm gonna go, I hope you wanna go with me, but I'm going, because mm -hmm. I knew there was something that was gonna happen. And I would say that if, if there was a precipitating event or someone, it was Andy in two ways. One, his presence, he's really solid, full, I mean, he's really rich, and he has a lot of knowledge because he's been around the block a long mm -hmm. time. And he was very helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to note that uh, in some people's minds, what you were doing is off the program. Ah! Because you're supposed to stick on, you know, the one path you've been taught. Yes. And, you know, not deviate. You don't dig ten wells that are ten feet deep. You dig one well that's a hundred feet deep. You know, you hear these analogies. But on the other hand, you know, a number of the people I've interviewed um, have had really good results from just kind of following their inclinations, their intuition, and checking this out and checking that out. And it's really kind of, you know, been very productive for them. So. Ultimately, I think it's up to the individual how they want to proceed. But it's it's interesting to note that you know, and you're, you're you're another example of somebody who checking out various things, and each thing was adding some enrichment to your experience. Yeah, I never took anything away. Right. Yeah, I always added something, and it mm -hmm. was like that. I had read that book, Suzanne Siegel's book about collision with the infinite. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I had to read it eight times, and I finally got what she was trying to say. She would say, well, I did the next obvious thing. Mm -hmm. Well, it took me a long time to figure out that the next obvious thing was only obvious because she was already doing it. Mm -hmm. And that these things would appear, 
something that would appear in the weekly reader or there'd be a poster and it would be like, yes, mm -hmm. there was no question. I'm going to go. Right. I don't care if I'm off the program or not off the program. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't matter one twip. I'm going to go see that person because mm -hmm. there's something there for me. Yeah. And sometimes it was just pay my respects. Sometimes it was just interact or I'd laugh or something. There was something there for every person. But Andy came in with a very structured six weekend course that we did over about two years. Mm -hmm. So we got to be with him for six mm -hmm. weekends, Friday, all day Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Mm -hmm. And a lot of stuff went down and a lot of it I already knew, but he put it together in a way that made more sense, a lot more knowledge that way he put it together. And he taught us a little technique that it was not meditation, it was mm -hmm. a little bit more paying attention to your breathing. Mm -hmm. That was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Throughout the day, or in just during a, a, a separate, separate session, little, yeah. yeah, not to be done mm -hmm. in the dome, not right. not to be called a regular meditation, just something private yeah. that you do for yourself. I think there are Buddhist meditations like that. I don't know much about them, but you know, you're focusing on your breathing. Yeah. And uh, so, it sounds like things are starting to percolate. You you did the Gangaji thing, you did the Andy thing, and and you know the pieces are coming together. And uh, but I think we're sort of leading up to a point here where there was a. It was. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll back up. The, the, the first time I spent with Andy, Andy also would be, he would give you private time where you would actually sit, where he would teach you his meditation technique, but he would meditate with you. Mm -hmm. And the first time we sat together, the experience was so profound, I couldn't even explain it for a year. Mm -hmm. It took me one year to be able to tell Andy what happened that day. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even, I didn't have words for it. But essentially what later I began to understand that at least for me what it looked like was I was looking at what appeared to be a piece of plate glass that was infinitely thick. Hmm. But it was clear, crystal clear, you could see right through. And what was popping off the surface was what looked like, if you followed it, would be like a trunk, a worm with segments to it. Mm -hmm. But it started at the plate glass, and it went up and did things and made curly cues, and it went back through the mm -hmm. plate glass. But when I looked at it, I didn't say, oh, there are a bunch of worms there. Mm -hmm. The words that came later was, those are mantras. Mm -hmm. They're vibrational qualities. They're coming from nothing manifesting into the relative world. And then the next thought was, well, wait a minute, where are they coming from? Because they appear to be coming from nothing. So my consciousness was able to go down and look right through that glass, and there's nothing in that glass, but these things are coming up. And then I said, well, how deep does this go? And it went as deep. But I couldn't even talk about it because I didn't have words. I couldn't, it, visually, it was, it was an overload, another overload that couldn't be totally defined. A year later, after we'd had the fourth weekend with Andy, I finally began, Andy, I've got to talk about this, and I really need to clarify it. And how he put it to me, he said, look, from what I'm hearing and what you're giving to me, he says, you actually got to the level where the relative and the absolute are coming together. Mm -hmm. Just, you're on that level. And he said, and the reason it took so long, you're not used to being there, but he says, I can verify for you that that's the level you function from now, 24 seven. Hmm. Whoa, that seemed like too much, Andy. You go, no, 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 you'll get used to it. Don't worry about it. Hmm. Like, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. Hmm. And it was only two months later, I was standing in the middle of Third Street over here by the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. but on the, uh, talking to a friend. And we were talking about Andy. It was like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. The fan wanted to know if he should take the course. And I said, yeah, yeah, it's great, great, great. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm telling him a long story, something like the story I probably just told you. I don't remember what I was telling him. All of a sudden, in the middle of the story, it was clear. You're awake now. But I never stopped telling the story. Mm -hmm. I get to the end of the story. When I finish the story about Andy, I said, oh, by the way, while I was telling you the story, thank you very much, I just realized I'm awake. I know mm -hmm. who I am. And the guy looks at me, you know, don't tell me this stuff, right? <laughs> okay, don't have to believe me. It's fine. I'm, I'm happy. So that's interesting because obviously it wasn't a flashy thing. You, no. didn't, you didn't have to sit down and close your eyes or anything like that. No. It was like undetectable by the guy you were talking to. And 
when you say, let's define, let's, let's elaborate on the term a little bit, you know, you said, I am awake, I know who I am. So how, how did you, I mean, what did you know yourself to be which you didn't know before that conversation? I guess the easy way would be to say I knew myself to be consciousness and everything else was just a manifestation of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I also knew that I'd always been awake. Mm -hmm. But all these other things that had happened, I didn't have the knowledge to understand what that meant. I didn't know what those things were. And the, but it was totally undeniable. Mm -hmm. and I, and you could, at that moment, I would have, you know, okay, you're going to stay there, we're going to, you have to die. Okay, I'm done. I'm, 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 I know, there's no way. I, can I defend it? Can I define it? But no, I just know. There's this knowingness of mm -hmm. who I am. And that's about as good as I get at that point. Um, and so when you say, I know myself to be consciousness, I mean, ordinarily, you ask somebody who they are, and they say, well, I'm so-and-so. They give you their name. Yeah. And they say, well, they'll tell me more. Well, they give you their job. <laughs> they give you their, their family. Where they their live. Family, like, and they like skiing, and they, they yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all kinds of stuff about themselves. All the relative yeah. stuff. And you know, if you t start taking all those things away, well, if you didn't have your name, or if you didn't have your wife, or did, if you couldn't ski, or w you know, what is left, you know, and I don't know. Ah! You know? <laughs> and so what you're saying is that the sort of essential thing, um, you finally kind of sifted that out from all the other stuff that we ordinarily assume ourselves to be, and realize yourself to be that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, a, and it was very clear unmistakable, no doubt. Now, I'm, I will say later on, doubt came up. Doubt mm -hmm. does live a long life. Mm -hmm. it, it, it has a, a process that it goes through. But at that moment and for months later, it was absolutely clear to me, this is who I am. It's always been who I am. I've always been awake. And then it was like, oh, those times of clarity that had happened since I was a child, I would, there would be days. It was like, ah, oh, boy, this is so beautiful. Everything's clear. And then, you know, back with the nuns, you know, slapping you around and all <laughs> the, the usual stuff that happens to kids. But there would be uh, these little, and then I could almost like, it was like kind of watching a, a wave roll back through my life. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it was like that day, that day, that day, that day. You could day. recognize what it had yeah, been. Yeah, all of a sudden, all those days that had been put in a kind of a, I don't know what happened, but there was something different about that day. Mm -hmm. And it was almost like they all got connected in that moment. It was a mm -hmm. real connectivity that happened. And so after that moment, as you lived your day-to-day -day life, going to the store, driving your car, you know, doing whatever you do, um, what was different about your life than what it had been before that? There was a, a, a sense of silence and peacefulness and happiness and bliss, mm -hmm. kind of all those nice words that don't really mean a lot, but what they want, there was a, a sense of completeness to my life. Mm -hmm. No matter what you took away from me, what you gave to me, it isn't going to get any more complete than this. This is mm. total feeling of I'm complete. There is nothing more to seek after, nothing more to chase after. If I die now, I'm done. It's great. Mm -hmm. Nothing. There's no unmet needs. It's all everything's taken care of. Mm. And then my life felt like it was being taken care of. Mm. I was working as a handyman. Here I go. I used to make more money in an hour than I was making in a whole week, but mm -hmm. I was happy. I was yeah. doing this little thing with my hands and working. Just, it was a good life. Mm -hmm. And, um, what was I gonna say? I forgot what I was gonna ask you. Um, do you feel that, uh, well, what year was that now? This I think that would have been 01. 01, so we're about nine years after that now. And even though your life felt complete and like nothing really could be added or taken away right. at that point, uh, I suspect that you feel that there has been plenty of progress since then. Yeah, I, the way I like to describe it, maybe I'll give it a try, I'll give it another go, okay? Mm -hmm. It's like the feeling and the knowledge that you know the entire container of all knowledge. Mm -hmm. You're a you know that's who you are. You just don't know all the details. But I don't worry about it because I tell everybody, I work for the CIA. Whatever I need to know, it comes up. I, <laughs> and on a need to know basis, uh -huh. it's fine. And people, things happen all the time. More people come at me, more things I learn. And the more I interact with other people who know they're awake and I know they're awake and they know they're awake, 
things happen that just mm -hmm. make this just a, a great trip. And awakening is, if, if I understand it correctly, is not so much about knowing stuff anyway. No. It's, it's more about the container that holds that stuff. Right. Which it's you, like, you, you no, kind of just said. It's a knowingness as knowingness. opposed to a no. There is a knower, but the feeling right. is you all of a sudden know that you're knowingness itself. Right. And that's therefore what is, if there's anything that you need to know, it's there it, mm -hmm. on a need to know basis. Whatever you need to know, and you really need, I mean, uh, your life, something in your life says, do you need to know this now? Not five minutes from now. No. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Or mm -hmm. somebody asks you a question and you never had ever, oh, okay, that's there. Mm. Um, it, that kind of leads to a question I was going to ask, which is that, you know, I think some people mistakenly assume, even people, some people who think they're awake and may not be, but also people who aren't awake and know they're not, they somehow think of awakening as something that the ego gets or the ego <laughs> possesses or, or has, you know, I am awake, you know, like my individual self is going to contain uh, this thing called enlightenment or, or awakening or something like that. And, it, and I, I have the sense that it's turned around backwards, you know, that, and maybe you could elaborate on that. Yeah, the, the little small self, I mean, the classic definition is awakening could be classified as when large S self knows large S self. Mm -hmm. This individual unit is part of one consciousness. There is only one. But each of these small units that walk around seeming to be separate are a sense organ of the infinite. Mm. And there's the knowingness that the sense organ, the sense of the infinite, turns back on itself, says, peek -a <laughs> like a little kid. Huh. Whoa, what happened? Mm. Oh, I'm the one consciousness mm. in this body. And there's just a sense of after having been through a lot of other stuff, though, the other stuff had to come first. It was all of a sudden, mm -hmm. for me, a lot of stuff had to happen before I was ready to go, yeah, that's good. So as the one consciousness in this body, yes. um, obviously you identify with this body more than this body mm -hmm. or the producer's body or whatever. We, but, we, we, but like you say, sense organ of the in infinite. I think that's a beautiful phrase. It's, it's like, I'm the infinite, and then there's this sense organ, this body, this, the senses it has, which are you know, which I as the infinite am living through. Mm -hmm. Would that be a, an apt description of it? Yeah, I take to tell people that what for me, the sense that happened was that bef there was this sense of this eye that was a pretty small eye, but that's what the attention was on. And there was this slight subtle shift that all of a sudden there was a knowingness that, that I was really that functioning as an eye. So the identification went from small eye mm -hmm. to that. And it was just like, whoa, this is a much better deal. Mm. Uh, I mean, no pain, no problems, no, de and, and not that life wasn't the same, but the feeling of problem this went away. Mm. Oh, as that functioning as I, I get to interact with people and some of them are nice and some of them aren't and some of them got problems and blah, blah, mm. blah, blah, this life goes on. Mm. But as that functioning as an I, also, it felt like I was a sense organ of the infinite. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want me to go here? Okay. Mm. Uh, this body's supposed to be there. Well, that's no problem because the body arrived there. Mm. Uh, did I, I, did, I wasn't going there, but that's just as good as where I thought I was going. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, you feel like you're spontaneously guided to go where you're needed or, or there's some purpose that your individuality may not grasp even, oh. but, but that you kind of find yourself fulfilling. It's the next obvious thing. Ah. If the universe wants me here, obviously I got here on my own mm -hmm. without planning to go somewhere else. I must be that I'm supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. So let's just go find out what the universe has in store. Mm. And it's always fun. Yeah. Deepak Chopra is fond of saying that, you know, we're not human beings having spiritual experiences. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. And I think you could modify that phrase slightly to not not merely that we are spiritual beings having a, a human experience, but that we are being itself, universal consciousness. Having, the one being. Ha, yeah, the one being, having human experiences, grasshopper experiences, elephant experiences, bird experiences, you know, whatever sense organ of the infinite we happen to be looking through. Yeah. There were a couple of instances why I was out with lectures of different people 
and all of a sudden I found myself looking out through, in effect, I'm with you, I mean, you and I are in this meeting, and all of a sudden I'm looking through Ricky's eyes, mm. and well, wait a minute, I've never saw me from that viewpoint. Mm. And so somebody said, well, what's it like to be inside Ricky's head? I'm not inside Ricky's head, I'm just looking through Ricky's eyes. Huh. And, but it's still me, yeah. except that, yeah, this body's out here. Why that experience came up, I don't know. It's it happened a couple of times, something right? Happened. Well, I must be. I needed to learn something about that. Hmm. That it was that this consciousness isn't that discreet, right? Yeah. How can you be looking out, looking through Ricky's eyes? I don't know. <laughs> it happened a couple of times. Once with Chopra, even I got mm -hmm. really intensely watching him. He was teaching. Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, I'm looking through Chopra's eyes, and there I am in the second row. Like, hmm. whoa, that was interesting. Hmm. Didn't last long. So. Um, What has been the, the kind of, uh, you know, before we got to the awakening experience, yes. uh, 2001 in, in the middle of 3rd Street, we were, we were kind of going through this timeline of significant events or yes. significant, you know, both inner events and outer events in your life that kind of led up to, even though I don't think we can honestly say that there was a causal relationship between this, 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 and, and awakening, there but, is. but still it's interesting to <coughs> trace, yeah, it's fun. trace the thing. Um, so if we go from the point at 2001 when you had that, your awakening, mm -hmm. when you knew who you were, are, um, how would you, what, what, what would you consider significant and worth talking about between then and now in terms of various stages of development or what what changed in your perception of the world or anything that you think people would like to hear? Okay, I want to tell you one that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. When I first knew I was awake, it was unmistakable. And within three or four months, all of a sudden, this old monkey mind that's been around for a long time and has a lot of tricks started introducing doubt. Mm -hmm. How could I be awake? Yeah, you know, how could I be this? I mean, blah, 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 the mm -hmm. usual stuff. And you've been in Fairfield, you know you've heard this mm -hmm. routine. And I made the mistake of telling a few people, and boy, that got the old stuff yeah. going, you know. Who are you to say you're a wig? Because I know better, you're just a, I know. <laughs> so this started to build, and anyway, it was, there was two things that happened that were significant. One of them was, Somebody walked up to me and said, look, we're gonna, they're going to have a live satsang with Gangaji mm -hmm. over at, I think it's the Peterson's house, and they're mm -hmm. going to do an ISDN live, four ISDN lines, live telecast. We're going to, mm -hmm. she's going to be there. What do you think? He's like, wow. Went over, she was doing this gazing routine, mm -hmm. and she got you into a chair, and so she was actually in California or something. Right. This is all so going through the internet. All going through the internet. Yeah. Well, actually, ISDN lines at that uh -huh. time, they, were, they had yeah. purchased four to mm. get the capacity. So she had a chair in the middle of the room. You sit on the floor for a good hour, and your mm. butt's fast asleep. You get in the chair. So I get in that chair, and I'm asleep. My butt's asleep, so I just wiggle around. She goes, what's that all about? And I looked at her, and I laughed, <laughs> which I do a lot anyway. And then she started looking at me, and she says to me, you are the one. And that's all she said, but we're staring at her. And at that moment, I was in California looking back at myself in Fairfield hmm. through her eyes. Hmm. And there was some recognition of things that were going on. And, and it was like, whoa. And then she said, okay, you're not, you know, that's it, you're done. Yeah. And that was fine. And then, oh, I don't know, a month later, seven friends of mine that you gotta go to Chicago and see Shalanda Saima because she's the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> now, not one, not three, seven. Mm -hmm. This is a command performance. You better show up. Mm. Not, not, none of them said that, but internally, I know. Okay, yeah. I gotta go show up. I don't know why, but I'm gonna show up. We get in this big hall, and all there is these little dividers, you know, those little wooden folding dividers mm -hmm. between you and the next group over. It's the class of 1952 having their 50th high school reunion uh -huh. playing Bill Haley in the comments <laughs> at the loudest volume you could think of. Uh -huh. And there was no way anything was going to happen. So she had us dance and 
chant and but you couldn't hear yourself dancing chant. to bill haley or? yeah we're dancing to bill haley <laughs> i mean what else you're going to do so this goes on for about an hour finally they take a break on mm -hmm. the other side so she gets time to do her sermon which right. i call i mean you know we would call it a sermon in, in the western view I, mean, mm -hmm. I don't know what they call it in india but she's given her talk her, her rap and she talks about a minute and a half and she lays out a mahavakya which is a way of helping people wake up I am that, I am that. All yeah, of this but she that. laid it out in a form mm -hmm. that was in the message of her sermon. Mm. And I laughed, mm -hmm. which I do. And most people who know me in town, I, my laugh is unmistakable. Yeah, you haven't done it on the show I yet. I can't do it because yeah. you haven't said anything. Tom has a laugh that's sort of like, <laughs> ha. <It's loud>. Anyway, <laughs> and she, I'm sitting way off on her right. Mm -hmm. And she gives me the glare. She's got those beady eyes looking mm -hmm. at me. I'm just like, what do I care, you know? Right. I'm looking back at her. And this goes on for a minute. Mm -hmm. Staring at her for a minute. I'm staring at her. She's staring at me. It's mm -hmm. like, I don't, I'm not afraid of you, sweetie. You know, you're great. <laughs> I love you. And that was the, what you said was fine. Mm -hmm. So then she turns to the audience and she says, but it was really for my benefit. Mm -hmm. She said, he knows. Mm -hmm. She talks another minute and a half. She lays out another Mahavakya of mm -hmm. getting people to, okay, you know who you are. And I laughed. And she every, this went on for half an hour. Right. Every time she'd lay one of those babies out, I'd laugh. It was a punctuation mark. Mm -hmm. And she says, to the, every time she did, she'd say, he knows. <laughs> I, I knew what she was talking about because mm -hmm. I was the same consciousness. And finally, she'd get to the point and nobody else is laughing. Mm -hmm. Finally, she says, look, he's getting it. What's wrong with you guys? I mean, I, yeah, he's the only one in here. So when I left that night, I didn't stay for the weekend. I drove from the Quad Cities to Chicago and back mm -hmm. in one evening. We didn't leave Chicago till like one in the morning, get back to Muscatine or at four o'clock in the morning. That sense of doubt was totally destroyed. Mm. There, it could never be there because there's an outsider who has just verified for you that you know. They mm. have gone out of their way to tell you you know, this has all been orchestrated. You get seven invitations to go hear some mm. woman tell you, you know. You better believe you know. It's interesting because I've heard you tell those stories before, but I never kind of heard it in the sequence of, you know, still having these doubts and everything. And then you ended up having these interactions with these people, which um, helped or which, you know, eliminated the doubts once and for all. Yeah. So it's interesting to see it all in, in that context. And it sort of has a kind of traditional component to it too because spiritual in spiritual traditions particularly in the Indian spiritual tradition it's considered necessary in most cases for the guru to kind of give you the final stamp of approval um, when you've awoken you may you may have awoken but be very doubtful about it or not realize fully that you have and the guru says the guru sort of says certain things makivakis as a matter of fact to kind of confirm it for you and once that doubt is removed that's it, yep. you know, you're done. I mean, it was, it felt unmistakable and un undeniable, but the doubt crept back in because I like to say it, you have a lot of virus software that got installed through, in my case, 60 years of life. Mm -hmm. And that, that virus software is pretty strong and it's got some pretty deep holes and it's scattered all over your hard drive and it's, na it's messy, yeah. nasty stuff. Yeah. And it would, some part would find that little piece of doubt and, Oh, but you, but, 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 mm. you know, all the buts, right? So after the Shalandama thing, the doubts never came in never at all? Never came back. Hmm. Interesting. And that was about near that time is I did a gig at the library where I just, mm -hmm. ah, I was compelled to get up and just tell the world. Mm -hmm. And I did a little gig and that led to, and that was filmed and on FPAC and maybe 25, 30 people showed up and mm -hmm. I met some more people that are awake and we had some nice rap and then, Cindy and I started having a meeting at, at my house and that was really wonderful because mm -hmm. people showed up and a lot more were awake than knew they were and we just began to have an interaction. This is the one that I have been going yeah, to. Yeah, the yeah. one you've been coming to. Yeah. And the interaction just made it richer. It's, mm -hmm. like, it's like having a stew. Yeah. And all of a sudden somebody comes in and says, well, I'm from New Orleans, I want to put a little of this in. Mm -hmm. Somebody else comes in from Canada and they want to put this in. Mm -hmm. it, nothing gets detracted, but it all keeps getting richer as an uh, uh, richer and richer and richer yeah well maybe this would be a good time actually we, we, we're not concluding the interview but maybe this would be a good time to tell people how to get in touch with you if they want to come to that 
uh, meeting. Okay. Or uh, either in person or on the phone. Okay. They can call my cell phone, which is 641-919-6917. Repeat, 641-919-6917. Or send me an email, Traynor, T-R-A-Y-N-O-R, at natel.net, N-A-T-E-L.net. I'll repeat, T-R-A-Y-N-O-R, at Natel, N-A-T-E-L dot net. Good. And, um, and I've been going to those meetings myself for almost, uh, almost since they started. It's funny because for a few months, you and a couple other people were saying, you really ought to come to these meetings. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll get around to it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and finally, I came to one. And I think I don't think I've missed one ever since, you know, unless I was out of town. Um, because personally, I've, and, and the size of the group has fluctuated from anywhere like, you know, six up to 35. 50. 50 in your it's living room? 50 one time. Yeah. They living were, room and kitchen. Yeah, they were like packed down the hall and, and whatnot. These days it's more within a reasonable range. Yeah. And um, it's more intimate. There's yeah. a dozen to 20, very intimate, lots of fun, mm -hmm. lots of younger people under 30. Yeah, That's I mean, this part. last week, was it this week? We had, or was two it weeks week, ago. two weeks ago? For the first time, we had more people under 30 than over 30. Yep. And some really bright kids. Who am I going to have on this show, actually? The next two interviews that I have scheduled are a 17-year-old girl and a guy in his, I guess he must be early 20s, um, who uh, are, you'll, you'll enjoy. <laughs> yeah, they're really fun people, and they're just fun to be around. And it, yeah. it makes whatever you're doing just richer. Yeah. Ama, Amachi, or Ama, as she's sometimes called, has the, uses the analogy, which she probably didn't think of. It's probably an old one that uh, you know, if there's a log that's burning brightly and you put another log next to it, then the second log gets burning more brightly. And um, you know, I th the whole reason, I think, that traditionally people have wanted to hang around enlightened people and, and that the Indian uh, tradition in particular says that the company of the enlightened is extremely valuable for your evolution is that there is this osmosis effect you know, that's contagious. Uh, you know, the, your own kind of light gets brighter when you're near people whose light is shining brightly. And so uh, personally, I, I find that that gathering uh, is extremely valuable to do on a regular basis. One time, one of my friends and I sat down and we started to list some of the people that we actually knew their names and, and, and see just, you know, okay, how many people have been through here and we know that they woke up? And a lot of them just come one, two times, they get what they need and they leave. Some stay longer, some. Mm. Uh, our long term in and out. But, so we got over 150 people, and it was like that was like two or three years ago. Mm. Just like, yeah, that one, oh yeah, I remember him, this, remember her. <laughs> Pretty soon you got this list, and it's, uh. but it was just fun because it was kind of like being of service. It's a mm -hmm. way to get a group to really just. One of the, my friends who shows up, he said it this way he said, it's a, an appointment to notice. Mm. And it's an appointment to pay attention. And he says, because we all get dizzy. And he said, we don't always sit down and notice or pay attention mm -hmm. to what is really going on. And it's just, he doesn't make it regular, but when he does, it's like, whoa, he's really happy when he does. Yeah. Oh, and I, I, I've mentioned it, but I want to reemphasize that there's, there is a professional quality conference phone in the room. And uh, a number of people over the years have called in on that, that we have like, what, 20 or 30 openings on the... We have 20 openings on the bridge. We never even got close to no, using them all. But if, if there was enough demand, We'd the get bridge bigger, could get a yeah. bigger bridge. Yeah. And there's one couple in particular who lives out in California. And um, I don't think they've been calling in recently, but for a long time, years, they, they were calling in regularly. And uh, mostly just listening, but occasionally talking. And, you know, they just kind of got so enthralled with the whole thing that they, they've started to fly out here. <laughs> so like three, four times a year, they fly to Iowa and they, they hang around and do, do stuff in here in town and come to one of those meetings and then they fly back to Malibu. Yeah, and as, as rich and beautiful as Malibu is, the richness of spirit is here. Mm. The richness of money and beauty of the world is definitely in Malibu. Mm. And they, 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 to them, this is their ability to rest in activity. Yep. 
There was one other thing that mm -hmm. was significant for me, and I guess as you were talking, it was there was this guy <coughs> on who was on the chat group Fairfield Life. Mm -hmm. He a guy called Larry up mm -hmm. in Madison, and his login I think was <coughs> Larry, Larry in, in Larry in Madison, <laughs> and he wrote this beautiful exposition about his own awakening, mm -hmm. and it was just well written, <coughs> well crafted, clear, very concise of what had happened to him during one day here when his life changed radically. And it, it was just great to watch and listen. And it was a long piece because he also included what happened over the next week or so and mm -hmm. how all of a sudden a three or four year or half a dozen year career in Fairfield, two days later it's over. Mm. He knows who he is and his time in Fairfield is done. And I'm reading this, reading this, reading this, and it was like just a joy to read it. And this was probably sometime in 02. <clears throat> and when I looked up from reading it and I looked at the wall, I recognized that wall as myself. Hmm. The primary recognition was self, but it was also the wall. Hmm. But it was unmistakable wherever my eyes fell for the next year or so, mm -hmm. what became primary was self masquerading as this wall hmm. or being a wall I mean right. it was ma it was being it was this it was that functioning as a wall that functioning as a table mm -hmm. but it was clear that this was that that this is myself functioning as a table like well that's cool didn't change my life and it mm -hmm. wasn't even flashy it was just mm -hmm. like wow that is very but just one man wrote one email mm. and he shared with me something that was so precious to him it became precious to me and he made a huge difference in my life mm. and all of a sudden it's like well what do i do to you know help others because right. you know you got to pay it forward right yeah so all of a sudden okay then the meeting started because that was was like okay huh. this is the next obvious thing to do i'm glad you told that story because um i i was going to ask you something about this and it, it's a pattern that i've noted in a number of my guests and also in things that i've read and so on um, which is that you know, initially, it seems, one kind of experiences the self as sort of an inner thing. You know, I am this unbounded awareness, and then, but then there's my body, and there's the environment, and all that, which is different than my unbounded awareness. And, but then it seems to mature into, a, into a, a state in which you realize that that which you have discovered yourself to be, mm -hmm. essentially, is also the essence of everything else. Yep. And so... Um, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I'm just kind of reiterating, and you can come back with, with more. But, the, you know, when you see things or hear or whatever through all of your senses, you actually are sort of appreciating that th the essence of everything as yourself. Yes. And the same self inside, same self outside, and so it's a unity. Yeah, it, from my side, I, I would like to put it, I were first t when we first started talking, I said I, the f one thing I knew was that, that I was, the, that the, the, what I had thought of was the I was actually that functioning as an I. Mm -hmm. Well, the maturity of that appears to be that functioning as you mm -hmm. and that functioning as this. Mm -hmm. So then you begin to see it's all that, but the functional is, there's a functional Rick, there's a functional table, there's a functional wall, mm -hmm. and there's a functional Tom. It's all that doing its function, which is necessary to have a relative life. Would it be fair to say that there's a kind of a non-functional silent level to it and then a functional level, and it's the same thing, but it has these two sort of phases, or does that I don't not notice that other part. Which other part? The, the non, I mean, I don't notice a non-functioning. To me, it's all functioning. Even if it's deep silence. Oh, yeah. It's, it's the deep silence is still functioning. Uh -huh. It's not separate. There's no separateness. Right. And I, it's a, just a little subtler, a lot more subtle, but it's still that functioning as whatever it's functioning hmm. at in the relative world. And it, it just, for me, it's much easier to say it that way because that mm -hmm. appears to be my experience. Is mm -hmm. I just know everything to be that. And then there's, a, there's an I functional, there's a the Rick function, there's a Brian function, mm -hmm. there's a TV function, a camera function. It just functions, you know? Right. But it's all the same stuff kind of expressing yeah. itself in these different forms. Yes. Now, when you had the, you know, an initial awakening experience in, in the Rochester Center when you're eating dinner, and when you had the heart stomped on the floor and, and replaced with a much bigger, you know, heart, and, you know, these various stages of your life, it seemed to have an impact, and, and also when you had the now I know who I am yes. experience, 
each of those things um, you know, had its value in terms of your subjective experience. It made it a lot nicer, more interesting, more free. But it also seemed to have uh, an influence on your outer life, you know, your circumstances changed, or the way you interacted with people and your, and your environment changed. Yes. So when you went from this, now I know who I am state, to, you know, I'm, I now see everything as myself or in, in, as, that f as that functioning as a, as a table, as a camera, whatever, did that have uh, any impact that you're aware of on your, the way you behave, or the way you interact, or the way, your relative life? In, in one way, yes, that the, 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 it became absolutely clear that I didn't have any wants. Mm -hmm. More so than it even had been. Right. There. And all of a sudden, there's no wants. Mm -hmm. And there were needs, but the needs were always being met before I recognized them as needs. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of would describe it as what we would traditionally call a desire mm -hmm. no longer existed. In my life, desires weren't there anymore. Mm -hmm. All it was was there to be the idea pop up. What about this as a project? Okay. Mm. So what do we do to do this project? And many times the project would involve going down, let's call it, the tr or going down the garden path, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you get a left turn, right turn, and then all of a sudden, oh, let's go right. And then, the, then you go a little further, well, let's take another right. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon I'm back where I started, but something happened in the process, and oftentimes it did and there was also a feeling from the beginning of the idea that this is a project that I didn't even need to complete the project to have the fulfillment of the project. Now you're talking about an actual project. An here. actual project. Not, not just some metaphorical No, thing. no, yeah. no. This is a, like, okay, Cindy and I made a decision we really needed to have a runabout at the river because the big boat burned too much gas and the little boat you have was a house too boat. small. We have a houseboat. Right. And the little boat's too small because there's too much traffic and the big boat burns a lot of gas. So we really need to get a boat. And we did a lot of shopping, and I did a lot of looking, and blah, blah, blah. Lots of things happened, and it was a long-term project. It was like, well, this is what would be good, mm -hmm. but I'm, if I don't get it, that's fine. But there was a feeling all along that this is going to work out somehow. And I know people have given me grief for telling the story, but we didn't. Cindy's mother had a boat in the garage. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to ask her for it because her brother was using it. Right. And there, we don't have any conflict in the family. We're just, Mom, we're not going to even t go there. I'm not going to even ask Mom for the boat. Mm -hmm. Never said a word that this is the project we've been looking at. Mm -hmm. Cindy gets a Christmas card with the title to the boat mm -hmm. in the Christmas card. And Mom didn't know. We weren't going to give her brother right. a hard time. Right. But Mom didn't, hadn't let us know. He was using it without registering it, uninsured, mm -hmm. and the plates on the trailer mm -hmm. weren't registered. She got, pissed. she got mad at him. She right. goes, he's doing a crime, a, you know, civil. Mis but misdemeanor. It's, yeah. it's a misdemeanor, but it's still, and, right. it's her, and it's registered in her name. Right. Now, I could have never anticipated, and we had, we had talked to us, no, we're not going to ask mom for this boat. It would mm -hmm. be a nice boat, but no, we're not going there. It just kind of happened. It, and it happened. Yeah. So you tell people that, and they go, why didn't you ask your mom? Are you stupid or something? <laughs> I just told you why we didn't ask mom, right? We yeah. didn't want to cause hardship in the family yeah and he and he definitely was mad he yes. his her brother got mad mm -hmm. you took my boat uh sweetheart you didn't pay it hadn't been registered for eight years <laughs> and your mom asked you it's only 25 bucks a year i yeah. mean this is not a big deal no it's an interesting example actually because um well maharishi mahesh yogi for instance uh, who the teacher founder of transcendental Meditation, he always used to say that uh, you know as you become more evolved, more enlightened, or whatever term we want to use, it, it should only be necessary to just have the desire for it to be fulfilled, rather than sort of running all over like a monkey, get, get, getting what you want. Just have the desire, and then just kind of go back on the self, and if it's the right desire, which it will tend to be if you're, you know, in a good place, it'll just come to you. But it, that's the point, is it didn't feel like a desire. Mm. It felt like somebody popping up Hey, here's a project. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. I mean, mm -hmm. that's kind of how I now I live my life. Projects come up, and they seem like good ideas. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I go off and do them, and they they lead me to something I would never have done. Yeah. So this project actually is an impetus to get to the next project, which I didn't have a desire for. I didn't have a need for. I didn't know about the other project. Mm -hmm. This project takes you somewhere else. Oh, 
all of a sudden this project morphs into that project, oh, this is a lot better than what I was thinking about. <laughs> so it, it's kind of, yeah, that's how life has become. And so I, things, in other words, work out kind of better than they would if you had to sit down and plot them. They, they, there's sort of a larger kind of planning mechanism going on here that you don't even know all the, all the mechanics of, but it's... And you don't need to know. Right. I mean, essentially, I, I, tell, I kid people all the time. I said, you find out you're working for the CIA. Uh, you have a need-to-know basis. Mm -hmm. They give you projects, you do the project, they give you a paycheck, everything's fine. Don't ask too many questions, don't worry right. about it. Right? And I know I'm, I'm doing this in a metaphorical way. Yeah, because I think people understand. Because it, feel, it, it feels easy. It feels right. like, yeah, well, this is what I'm supposed to do today. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any idea what I'm going to do tomorrow. Right. I'll figure that out tomorrow. I think some people might say, all right, well, you know, your life seems to be relatively easy, nothing too serious going on, you can just cruise along and enjoy it and so on. And, but what if, you know, what if you were confronted with something really traumatic. And you know, since I know you, I happen to know that you had a heart attack a year or two ago. Yeah. And it would be interesting may maybe to hear, you know, what someone who is awake, <laughs> so what someone who knows the self, <laughs> how, how they experience a heart attack as opposed to how somebody else might experience it. I, again, when it first started, mm -hmm. there's a part of us that's always in denial. When it first started, it was like, well, I don't know what's going on. And I walked up three flights of stairs with two gallons of water, which mm. isn't a lot of weight. Right. And I had been gaining weight, and there were reasons for that. And I get up there, and I'm out of breath, and my heart's pounding. Mm. But I don't connect I'm having a heart attack. So I walk in, I set the water down, and I just say, well, maybe I'll just lay down. And I laid on the bed one second. It's like, that's not a good idea. Uh -huh. Get up. And then I started feeling nauseous, which mm. is a classic symptom. You, you're mm. feeling like you're... Right. Maybe it's, you know, like, oh, this pressure. I must have gas. Yeah, I've got yeah. gas here, right? Yeah. Go ahead and take a handful of Tums. Nothing happens. Uh. Walk back in the living room, and maybe I should sit down here and meditate. It'll all go away. And then uh, the pre this was on Thursday, and I was supposed to go to my friend's funeral service. Warren Wexler had died oh, Warren, Sunday sure. night. Yeah, I went to that. This is Thursday. Mm -hmm. I had stayed in town ordinarily on mm -hmm. that evening. I would have been on my car on the way to my boat, a two-hour mm. boat ride right. or two-hour yeah. car ride, and I'd have been having this heart attack in somewhere the on the highway. This right. not would have been good, right? <laughs> so, and all of a sudden there was this voice, and I'm, I know it sounds terribly crazy, but this voice, it was, pro it was my own voice saying, so, are you going to be the next Warren Wexler? <laughs> and all of a sudden it dawned on me, you idiot, you're having a heart attack. Yeah. I called my wife on the cell phone, not wanting to drive, mm -hmm. not trusting myself. Who knows what's going to happen? I said, Cindy, I'm having a full-blown heart attack. I need you to drive me to the hospital. And I knew she had the car. She mm. had taken the car. Why don't you just dial 911? Uh, I didn't want to wait. Yeah. Okay. She just dropped everything. And she was there in less than 30 seconds because oh. her, her, she was only a block away. I see. She says to me, get on your hat and coat. Mm -hmm. Well, I translated that into... Well, let's go out front and wait for her. It'll be quicker. Mm -hmm. Put my hat and coat on. It was fall, late October. Walking down the stairs saved my life. Because the leg muscles, because I have pretty oh, massive muscles, they're pressing the blood yeah. that's in the legs back huh. up. Huh. At that moment, the pain went from excruciating mm -hmm. to, I can live with this. Mm. Went over to the hospital, walked in, said to them, I think I'm having a heart attack. I didn't say I know I'm having a heart attack. That's right. not the thing to say. Yeah. I think I'm having a heart attack. All of a sudden, I got seven people yeah. hear me. And the first one was kind of rough. The second one was really rough. Mm -hmm. It felt like an 800-pound gorilla was on my chest. Mm. But and consciousness and being seemed to disappear only for a short time. During the 800-pound gorilla one? The 800-pound gorilla, maybe a minute. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, it was like... What was there when the consciousness of being just, just pain. pain. <laughs> total, unmitigated, right. total pain. There's no room for anything else. Yeah. But after it abated just a little bit, they start pumping drugs in you, and they're mm -hmm. giving, they give you lots of stuff. And I already had stuff, and they're giving me more. All of a sudden, consciousness peeps its head up and goes, See, I didn't go anywhere. I'm uh -huh. here. And never left. Even, mm -hmm. And then I had another attack at midnight. 
and another one at five in the morning, mm. and that one never stopped. And so I got an ambulance ride to Iowa City, mm. and I got a stent put in at 10.30. The poor man that was supposed to get his got bumped. He oh. got moved to later in the day because he wasn't critical. Right. The guy at 10, though, was in worse shape than I was, uh. so he went ahead. I got mm. a stent. <coughs> that whole thing related back to the car accident. Mm. The car accident I had had crushed my chest and it crushed one of the arteries oh, so badly. Scarred. Scarred and crushed it, and the, uh, the artery never responded. Mm. And when our, it's like kinking a gas line. Didn't have its elasticity. Or no, it was really crushed badly. Yeah. They put a stent in, it's open, I'm doing fine. Mm -hmm. But throughout that, there was never a doubt, even when that 800 pound gorilla was there, there's no doubt that everything was just going along the way it needed to go. And I didn't know that that this piece of my heart needed to be fixed, but mm. that's why I was had all my problems with weight, why I wasn't sleeping well, all of the high blood pressure, it was mm. all that little kinked mm. thing. Here I am a year and a half later, my blood pressure is almost down to normal, the weight's starting to come off. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting a, what they call a CPAP machine to help me breathe at night. Mm -hmm. I'm better than I ever was in terms of feeling well. Right. Things are, but there's a full-blown heart attack, you know, yeah. Life goes on, yeah. and, you know, but the, that feeling that, okay, so what if I die? And the doctor got, you know, I got into a little tussle at the hospital because he told me I was, you have to take statins. And I'd done some research on them. I said, no, I'm not. And he said, well, I'm not going to do the statin. I go, get me another doctor. <laughs> He's the only one there, right? But, right. It was, but you know, just getting mouthy with the guy. He's just like, you're having a heart attack and you're in trouble here. You need to do what I tell you. Yeah. No, I don't. Well, he, were statins something you would take right then and there or something he wanted long you to term. take long term? Yeah. I had to promise I was going to take him. Oh. I said, I don't promise you nothing. Huh. Do your job. Huh. Oh, we had, I mean, he says, how dare you argue with me? <laughs> so there's this presence that's there. Yeah. You're in pain, you're suffering, but you've still got this presence to tell this guy, you know, I, I'm not going to kiss your butt, buddy. <laughs> you may be the doctor, but and yeah. I know it sounds silly, but it was just, that's how it unfolded. Yeah. It was like, there's presence of who I am, mm -hmm. and I'll listen to what you have to say, but you can't tell me what to do. Right. Which, to some extent, is just a, a, fa a reflection of one guy's personality compared to another guy's personality. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you can take... Ten people who have had a spiritual awakening, put them all in the same circumstances, they all might respond differently. They, are all going, they will yeah. respond differently. Right. Right. They have some common occurrences. One, of, the one thing that I t I'd like to tell people that I have found to be helpful to a lot of people, there was this interesting book that I read. It was written in the year 2000. It's available used. It's called, the title is very long. It's called Perfect Madness, colon, The Path from Awakening to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. That has been so helpful to myself and a lot of people. I really it has so much knowledge about, because people have a feeling that, oh, enlightenment comes first and then, and then everything's gone and it right, don't quite work in. that way, right? <laughs> you have the awakening and then you have stuff. Mm -hmm. And this woman went through, <clears throat> in a period of 40 weeks, mm -hmm. what? you and I have gone through in 40 years. Mm. She's got a very compressed experiences like you and I've had over 40 years compressed into 40 weeks. It was an, a 40 week intense journey for her. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. She went from awakening to enlightenment. Well, then it only took her 27 years to write the book. Mm. Actually, 37, yeah, about 27 to years. To kind of um, process it all. Process, yeah. she had to process what had happened she had kept a journal, then she started to flesh it out, <clears throat> and it still took her, it took her 20 years to start the book and seven more years to publish it. Hmm. 27 years to get all of what had happened to her into some kind of, we're not talking a big book. This no. is thin, yeah. but it's loaded. And it helps people understand that there's, there's just this simple awakening where you know something about who you are, mm -hmm. and then there's this path <clears throat> of progress that's going to take who knows how long, mm -hmm. and then maybe enlightenment's there, maybe it's not. Who cares? It's the process that's important. Mm. Adya Shanti has written a similar book. Um, he's a spiritual teacher who is coming to Fairfield in about a year. And, um, the End it, of Your World, right? Yeah, yeah. The End of Your World. And it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting book. It's, it's for people who basically have had a spiritual awakening, 
uh, and again, by that we don't just mean some cool experience that came and went, but you know, they basically had a, a significant and apparently permanent shift. But then, as you say, it's not all roses and butterflies at that point. There's actually quite a few s things that you have to c process or go through or come to terms with after that initial awakening. Yeah. And so this book is like a, a handbook for people in that situation. <coughs> I tell a lot of people, okay, here's, I want to tell you the good thing about awakening. The good thing is you're awake. Let me tell you the bad news. You're in kindergarten. Mm. You've got a lot, a lot to learn because every concept that you've had is built out of something that's no longer true. You're not who you thought you were. Mm -hmm. You're something different. And the awakening gives you the sense of what you are, but now you've got to go figure out every concept that you thought so was so near and dear to your heart and that meant so much to you has to be examined and see mm -hmm. how it relates. And it's not that you lose it. You just change your relationship to it. Mm. I think it's an important distinction because, I you know, even around Fairfield where, you know, when, when you mention or when I mention this show, for instance, and, and, and people say, oh, yeah, you're interviewing people who think they're enlightened. Yeah. Uh, which is a, you know, sort of a, a derogatory right. way, you know, like. Those fellows. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, what do they think they are, perfect or something, you know? Um, and my response is usually that there are many degrees of awakening. There are many stages. There are many processes you have to go through. And, you know, I'm not necessarily interviewing people who are at the ultimate pinnacle of human evolution, if there is such a thing. But, you know, there happens to be a fairly significant number of people around here who have really crossed some important thresholds and who, you know, are continuing to, you know, chart territory that's becoming more and more common. You know, they're, they're, they're really you know what I'm saying. And we help each other. Yeah. That's part of our mutual task here mm -hmm. is none of us have the whole picture, but we all have a really nice picture. And when we share it with someone else, we begin to see that this picture, that picture, these other pictures start to give you a, a deeper understanding and knowledge mm -hmm. about what really is there. Yeah. Which is actually why I was motivated to do this show, you know, because I sort of felt like let's take awakening or enlightenment out of let, let's remove the, the cloak of specialness from it. Yes. You know, where you figure it's, it's not something which I could achieve because only these really special people who wear white robes or something ah. can, can, ah. <laughs> can have, you know, Buddha. So it's Buddha at the gas pump. It's, right. pe it's people who have, you know, achieved the, a state of awareness which traditionally might have been considered extraordinary, but they're ordinary people living ordinary lives, doing ordinary things, and you know they don't necessarily float two feet off the ground, or you know you don't, you're not necessarily going to see a, a glowing nimbus around them. But uh, you know th these, but it's real. Uh, these states are these. Th this way of living is gradually and maybe not so gradually seeping into the mainstream. You know it's becoming relatively commonplace, and who knows? You know, in, within our lifetime, it may. Just like our little meeting has shifted to predominantly all these young people, we might shift into a society in which, you know, this becomes so commonplace that it wouldn't even make sense to do a TV show about it. Right? What's so special? <laughs> yeah, it, one of the kids, one of the guys, used to say, he says, "Yeah, he says, what you find out, he says, you wanted to be special, and you found out, yeah, I'm special, but so is everybody else. Huh. Everybody's special. We all <laughs> have it because uh, our basic nature is, for at least the people I've talked to, there's a recognition." Awakening didn't happen to me. Awakening is my basic nature, and I just finally noticed. Mm. And if you look at it, and if you just even consider that as, well, what if I could just accept that, that I've always had this, and it's there, and, and someday I'll just notice it? Mm -hmm. It totally changes your relationship with this as a, as, a, as a topic or a process. Just noticing that, because everybody says the same thing. Yeah. Everybody I've talked to and you've talked to, you've been mm -hmm. around a lot of them, I know, because mm -hmm. you we hang out together every mm -hmm. Wednesday. They all say the same thing. Yeah. This wasn't added on. This was here. I just mm -hmm. discovered it. Yeah, and this word notice is a good one because you know there are a lot of people walking around here who have been meditating for 30 or 40 years, but who still sort of have this carrot, dangling carrot attitude, like I'm chasing this thing and I'm really, it's pretty, it's, it's really far away. Maybe I've only gotten it 5% or something and it's going to take how many lifetimes for me to achieve it? And as a matter of fact, though, you know, they're actually staring them in the face. You know, there's, it, they're, they're kind of, 
Well, it's like, think of it this way. Suzanne Siegel, this book you brought up, yeah. Collision with the Infinite. Correct. She had been meditating for many years, had been a meditation teacher and everything. And then she'd kind of drifted away from it a little bit and was just living a normal life in Paris, got pregnant, was you know, coming from a swimming event at, a, you know, at the local pool there and getting on a bus. And all of a sudden, she had this radical awakening. And it freaked her out because she didn't know what it was. And, and yet, you know, she had spent years listening to lectures and reading books and studying the whole thing about what she was then finally experiencing. But she didn't put two and two together. She didn't kind of connect that understanding she had gained and, and drifted away from a little bit with this experience because I think people's, they have a tendency to conceptualize based upon books they read and lectures they listen to. And the, and the, the reality of the experience doesn't necessarily match the concept. And uh, this is a little bit of a long-winded explanation, but I think that there are many people walking around who are having that very experience they're seeking, but because it doesn't match the concept that they have habituated themselves to over decades, they overlook it. Exactly. And so it, sometimes it takes just the subtlest shift. I've seen this happen several times in this Wednesday meeting we go to at your house, where people kind of shift and they say, so that's it. Ha! You know, I, but I've had this all along. Right. <laughs> and then the next thing is, I want my money back. <laughs> <laughs> and Ricky and I know who that is. Yeah, right. He was, was a, a very close friend of ours. Who, uh, it was, and it was so radical for him to say, wow, I really have had this 25 years. And it was here before. Yeah. And I, but it's been so intimate, I've been overlooking that which I am. Yeah, it's kind of like the old analogy of your glasses are on your head. And where are my glasses? I can't right. find my glasses. I'm looking all over the house for my glasses. They're, they're right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll give you one more thing that happened in, in maybe a couple of, maybe three years after. Mm -hmm. After this thing with Larry from Madison, mm -hmm. all of a sudden I was looking. The wall started to stop. It was always myself, but it stopped being so radical. All of a sudden, I just started appreciating everything. Mm. The wall, you. More so than you. Oh, I mean, total. Mm. It was like falling in love with everything that got in my path. Mm. Everything my eyes fell, I was appreciating it. And I don't use the word love so much. It's like love, but it's more than that. It's like, as a sense organ of the infinite, my job is to appreciate the universe. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's ramped. It's mm -hmm. full-blown. Mm -hmm. And it's like living life on steroids. <laughs> Spiritual like, steroids. Oh, God, it's like everything is, is myself, but it's I'm appreciating it as myself. Really, really intimate. And, and it just, and it went on for a long time, and it would somewhat wane if I was alone, but when I'm with people, it ramp city. Mm -hmm. And then one day it started to morph, and it changed from appreciation <clears throat> to intimacy. Hmm. And I use those words very carefully. I don't use the word love because love has some connotations, but appreciation is a really simple thing. It's just like, I appreciate a sunrise. I appreciate you as a friend. I appreciate whatever is going on. And all of a sudden, I was totally intimate with every person and everything hmm. I ran into. And all of a sudden, there was absolutely no separation mm. between anything in the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, it was all me, but it was really intimate me. So it went from knowing it was me to feeling it was me. So mm. that, was a, that was another transition. And once you have it on a feeling level, it's, it's, and you already, I already had the knowing level of it, mm -hmm. it was like, whoa, this is almost, only use the word almost, more than I can bear. Mm. It was, but it was cool. You're speaking of that in the past tense, but is that the way things are It now? is now, but it's not ramped up. So, because it's integrated. It's integrated. Right. That's what happens. The other part is people are still looking for this flashy, super thing that mm. happened 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and you've moved on. Right. The body acclimates to anything. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe so, you go look at prisoner of war camps, World War II, mm. what they did to soldiers. I mean, bodies acclimate. Yeah. And awakening is just another thing you acclimate to. It's not flashy. Right. It's just who you are. I often think that of, of myself and of anybody who's been on a spiritual path for, for some time that, you know, they feel like normal, you know, living life. But if they were somehow able to go from where they were 40 years ago or 20 years ago to where they are now, it would be radical. 
you know, be this r remarkable transformation. But it's been, instead, it's been incremental. You know, maybe there have been some little flashes here and there, but each time it gets integrated. And so it becomes just a normal, everyday state that you're living. It's no big deal. You don't think about it. That's right. <laughs> and then you continue, to, you can continue to not notice for a long time. Mm -hmm. But just not noticing doesn't matter that you're going you're gonna to get the experience, whether you notice it or not. But it's mm -hmm. more pleasurable when you notice because then all of the feelings that there's something missing go away. Mm. And that's what I see some of the folks here. They, there's that deep feeling, I'm missing something. Something's not right here. Yeah. And it's just an understanding that, oh, you've already got it. Mm -hmm. What more could you want? Yeah. Hmm. Great. Well, I think that's a good place to end. Great. <laughs> good to see you. Yeah, thanks. Good to be here and have fun. Yeah. So uh, thank you those of you who have stayed with us throughout this almost two-hour interview. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it, and we've enjoyed it in any, ca in any case. And um, whether you, however you're watching this, uh, whether on FPAC or uh, YouTube or listening to it as a podcast, we hope that you will continue watching. And as soon as uh, the titles roll, you'll see some links to um, websites and uh, podcasts and uh, my email address and, and so on so that you can participate in the show in, in various ways like that. And he'll give you my email if you email him. Yes, um, if you didn't catch it early in the interview, um, you'll see my, interview, my email in the, in the titles and you can email me with, for Tom's email for information about this Wednesday night satsang we've been talking about. Or even you can e email in questions that we will that I will ask future guests. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>